Today we're in Psalms 48 and 49. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 48. I'll read the psalm and we'll get into our study of the psalm, Psalm 48, and then we'll study Psalm 49. Psalm 48, beginning at verse 1, the psalmist writes, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in His holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled. They hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in travail, as when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever, Selah. We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness, in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following, for this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. Now, as we begin this in the first two verses, actually, great is the Lord greatly to be praised. I can't help but remember that. I was a young believer. I don't remember exactly how long, but it's been over 30 years ago that I remember we used to sing this particular psalm. Calvary Chapel uh, worship ministry very often in the early days would actually simply take psalms. Psalm 48 is a great example. We've already encountered some of the other psalms. And we would actually have, the, the musicians would actually take these psalms and, and put music to them, and we would sing them. This is one of those psalms that I remember singing as a relatively new Christian. It must have been within the first two years after being saved. So over 30 years ago, I can remember sitting in a house in, uh, I believe it was La Habra or La Mirada, I can't remember now, but we were in a house in a Bible study when I was introduced to this particular psalm, and we actually sang this psalm, Great is the Lord. And so what we look at here in Psalm 48 really is the beginning of a psalm that, that starts with praise. And you note that with me. It starts with praise. And as we go through this particular psalm, he's praising the Lord for a variety of things. He, he praises the Lord for God's greatness. He, he praises Him for His holiness. He, he praises God for His protection, for His loving kindness. He praises God for righteousness, for His judgments. And he concludes by praising the Lord for his guidance through this entire life and into eternity. This is a great psalm of great praise. And he's speaking of a great king. Now, this great king has chosen to reside among the people in his temple there at Jerusalem. Mount Zion is where the temple resides. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. You see, Mount Zion is referred here in this psalm as, as being a, a holy mountain because it's the location of the temple. And so he says in verse 1, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. He goes on to say, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So what makes Mount Zion beautiful isn't that it's a, a mountain that is beyond all mountains. Uh, the reason that it's called beautiful is because it's the place where the Lord has chosen to dwell amongst the people. It isn't the height or its majesty that he is extolling. Uh, it's that God has chosen to dwell amongst men there. You see, there are various, various uh, mountain ranges that are much more majestic than Mount Zion. But Mount Zion is a place where God has chosen to reveal his glory and where his, his presence uh, makes that mountain very beautiful. Now, how do we bring that into a contemporary illustration. Well, I was thinking about it today. For me, and this can, this can almost seem silly in a way, perhaps it is, but for me, I love the city of, of Chino. I, I do. I, I love the city of Chino. You know, some of you live in Chino. I love the city of Chino. So it's a great little city. But it wasn't the city of choice. There are a lot of cities that are an awful lot more beautiful than Chino. You know that, and I know it. 
There's a whole lot, there's a world of cities more beautiful than the city of Chino. Chino is a place that you're from. <laughs> it's not a place where you say, you know, one of these days I've got to visit that city or man, I'm, I just won't have lived, you know. There's Paris, there's Rome, and there's Chino. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> but you know what? I love Chino, and those of you who live in Chino, perhaps you do too. I love Chino for a lot of reasons. God put that love in my heart. But I love Chino because it's a place where we have a chance to gather here in this building to worship God. So what makes Chino beautiful to me is that I can worship God here in the city in this place. That's what he's talking about. He's not saying that Mount Zion is the most beautiful mountain in the world. If you've had an opportunity to travel, if you've ever flown over the Alps, I've flown over the Swiss Alps, and I've flown over the Spanish Alps. I've seen a variety of places in the world. I've had a chance to travel many countries throughout the world. I've seen the Andes, you name it. I've seen a lot of these places. And, and it's not that that is the most beautiful, most majestic site. Of course not. What makes it beautiful is God is there. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying that this is a beautiful place because the temple of the Lord resides there on Mount Zion and, and it's, it's beautiful in elevation only in the sense that it's a place that God resides. He says in verse 3, God is in her palaces and He's known as her refuse. So Jerusalem's strength and safety really result from Him being there, His presence being there. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, all the way in the... First, uh, one of the first five books of the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 27, we read, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. It is known as a place of refuge because God is there to protect them. Isaiah 57, 15 says, Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. It's not that the whole city necessarily understands that. There are people within the city who don't think the temple is really worth going to. But for those who have a heart to pursue the Lord, they understand what he's speaking about when he's saying how beautiful the elevation of Mount Zion is and one, how wonderful it is, and also how they can trust in the Lord who is their refuge. In verse 4, Behold, the kings assembled. They passed by together. They sought. And so they marveled, they were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in travail, as when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. So the presence of God actually produces different responses. On the one hand, for those who trust in the Lord, well, they're saying, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. But for those who don't trust in the Lord, He actually produces a terror in their hearts. For the God that... that, that you worship, and you love the Lord. Well, the thought of the Lord coming to receive you unto Himself is a comforting thought for those of you who are born again, for those of you who believe that Jesus Christ's Word is true, for those of us who believe that Jesus Christ made that promise that He would come and receive us unto Himself. That's a promise that gives me comfort through my lifetime because I am not afraid of seeing Him. I long to see Him, and therefore, the knowledge of God, the presence of God, the promises of God are, are things that, that, that I embrace, and, and I want to grow to trust even more. But if I'm not a believer, the presence of God, the power of God is something that I ought to be afraid of because He's coming in judgment. I'm a little boy. I've been pretty good. Mom says, Daddy's home. I run to the door. I anxiously await my dad to walk in so I can greet him. Or I'm a little boy, and I've been not so good, and my mom says, Dad's home. And man, I'm, I'm out of there. I'm hiding from him because Dad's home and Dad's mad. If I've been all right and long to see him, we have relationship, of course I long to see my papa. I want to see him come home. But if I've not been doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing, then there's a right for me. I have a right to be concerned when he comes in because I know that he's coming and he's going to deal with me. 
Well, a believer looks forward to being with the Lord. A believer looks forward to seeing Jesus Christ because His promises are true, and I embrace Him, and I'm able to see Him. But on the other hand, even as he's saying right here, there's going to be fear. In verse 6, he says, fear took hold of them and pain as of a woman in travail. He's simply speaking of the fact that uh, those who love the Lord will wonder at Him and praise Him, but those who are His enemies, there will be a terror that causes them to flee. Now, he speaks concerning, verse 7, uh, the ships of Tarshish. For those of you who take notes, I look this up because I, every time I, I read the word, I want to make sure that it's, it's the same place that it was last time. Tarshish is a port city founded by the Phoenicians in the nation of Spain. And so he's speaking concerning breaking up these particular ships and all. It's really a picture of God bringing judgment. Verse 8, as we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. God's word has been fulfilled, in other words, in their sight. They have heard, but they have also seen. See, there's one thing that we can say, well, I have heard of the Lord. There's another thing of saying, but I've seen the works of God. And there's a difference. As a matter of fact, it can be a very great difference. I'm remembering the book of Job, which is one of my uh, books that, uh, that has spoken to my heart as I studied it and as I taught it. And I recall how that Job is in chapter 1, it is uh, stated of him that he's a righteous man. You know the story. You know how that Satan appeared before the Lord when God called the sons of God, which are another way of referring to angels, and he called them to appear before him. And as he convened this, this uh, meeting with the angels, the Bible says that Satan was there present with the others. And the Lord God began to speak to Satan, and he asked him a question. It was in an interro uh, interrogation. He said, where have you been? And when Satan speaks to the Lord, uh, he says, well, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. And so God says, uh, have you considered my servant Job? Now, in that, when you study that book with me, if you were with me when I went through that book, I, I tried to point out that God was actually cross-examining Satan. God said, where have you been? And in essence was saying, I know you have been up to no good. Give an account of yourself. What have you been up to? When Satan says, I've been running to and fro throughout the earth, going back and forth, it's the same thing you find in the New Testament. I've been looking to see who I might be able to investigate so I could cause them to stumble. That's why God says, have you considered my servant Job? Have you investigated him? And then what was Satan's response? Job? Never heard of him. Who are you talking about? No, he immediately said, oh, yes. He says, but you put a hedge about him, and, you, and, and I can't get to him. And that's where the book of Job really begins, how the enemy takes everything he can from Job because he said, listen, if you, if you take his possessions or you take his health, if you take his health and wealth, he will curse you to your face. Why doesn't he have good reason to worship you? You have given him so much, but take the things from him, his family, take from him his health, and, and he will curse you to your face. But God had spoken earlier of Job. Remember what he said? He said he's a righteous man and he hates evil. God had seen the heart of his servant Job. But at the end of the book, after Job has gone through so much pain and so much suffering and so much sorrow, and when God begins to speak to him and begins to ask him a series of questions that are beyond his ability to answer, Job finally closes by saying, I heard of you with the hearing of my ear. But now I have seen you with the seeing of my eye. I heard of you, but now I see you. You see, we believe in God without seeing him, but there are times that God will manifest something of himself for us so that we do, so we can recognize the reality of God in our lives. And he's speaking here, as we have heard, so have we seen. What we have heard is true. It's consistent. The testimony is right concerning you. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalm 78, verses 2 through 4, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. We have received word from our parents and generations past concerning the works of God. We have heard those things, but we also have experienced those things too. 
In other words, it's not enough that my mom's a believer or my dad's a believer. I need to not only hear the stories of faith from them through the scriptures and what God has done in their life, but God also wants to make those things true in my own. And so that's what he's saying here in verse 8. Verse 9, we have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is, is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. And so as he thinks of God's love and God's righteousness, he cannot help but praise the Lord. These works do not pass him by. He meditates on them, and he finds strength in them. That's what he means in verse 9 when he says, We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness. I meditate on that. You know, um, I was asked a question, and I should probably pose the question to you and then give you the answer. I was asked a question once concerning meditation. And uh, it was a time when Eastern religion was getting a lot of press. And so somebody approached me and said, Pastor, what's the difference between Christian meditation and uh, Oriental meditation? Because meditation is, uh, was a real big thing then. It was getting a lot of press and all. And, and some of the church members were wondering, well, what's the difference? And I said, well, the difference is very basic. And this is a generalized thing. This obviously isn't as specific as it could be. But I said, one of the aspects of Eastern meditation techniques is the clearing of your mind. There's the removing of thoughts in Eastern meditation and an opening of yourself up. In Christian meditation, you don't clear your mind, you fill your mind. You fill your mind with the Word of God. You meditate on the precepts of God. You're not emptying yourself, you're filling yourself. And as you fill yourself with the Word of God, you mentally chew on what God is, is saying. Meditation carries with it the connotation, uh, thinking on these things carries with it the connotation of mentally chewing it and digesting it. And so that's what he's speaking about here when he says, we have thought on your loving kindness. Lord, we have made a decision that instead of every day remembering the bad things that have happened in my life, Lord, instead of every day just once again digging up some painful memory and rehashing that and rehashing that daily to the point that it has affected me so I'm depressed and I feel like I'm in a rut and I can never, ever get out of it. Instead of every day remembering a sad story or a sad experience or something that was crucial and critical in my life that was hurtful to me, instead of focusing my attention on the things that they said or the things that they did in my life. And a lot of people, and you know this, a lot of people wake up every morning with painful thoughts that they basically harbor the rest of the day. Things that were done to them, things that were said to them, things that, that injured them, things that they cried over. And they, at a drop of the hat, can remember the pain and they experience it every day, all the time. They remember how they were treated. They remember how they were disappointed. They can't get away from that. He said, I don't think about those things. What I think about is your loving kindness. What I think about is your righteousness. And these are the things that, that my mind is going to rest on, the things that, that, are, that are pure, the things that are wholesome. These are the things, the memories that, that, that I don't need. I want to leave those buried in the sea of forgetfulness. And, and the things that I want to keep my mind on are the things that demonstrate to me your grace and your love and your goodness towards me. That's what is going to change your life, by the way, the things that you meditate on. Because the things that you meditate on are the things that affect you right now. And so he says, the things that I am thinking about, well, it's your mercy towards me, your loving kindness, has said, your covenantal love. That's what I think of. I think of your righteousness, how good you are and how just you are. And these are the things that strengthen me. And I rejoice in that. That's why he says in verse 11, let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. I remember these things. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old, the psalmist in Psalm 70, 7, 11 says. And that's what he's talking about. In verses 12 through 14, continuing, he says, walk about Zion and go all around her. Counter towers, mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following, for this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. As you walk about the city, you're going to see that no harm has come to her. You're going to see that God has safely delivered her. 
because God protects the ones He loves. Not only does He protect, but God also guides those who love Him. Isaiah 58, 11 says, The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Jesus in John 16, 13 said, When the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. So he's speaking concerning the fact that our God is our guide. Notice that as he says, for this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. He's going to take you step by step through your life. In my testimony that I gave on one occasion, I chose to, to share out of John's gospel where Jesus said, now I'm alone, and yet I'm not alone for you were with me. And I shared very briefly something that I'll share with you. I shared on this one occasion how that as a, as a kid, I pretty much was by myself all the time, by choice and by disposition, to be honest with you. But I was by myself. I was, I was the kid when you went to school. I was the little boy who was sitting there with the sack lunch by himself on the table with no friends around him. That was me. That's how I was, by choice. I was lonely. I was always alone. And then as a young boy, my mom got ill, and I began to suffer with the concern that my mom was going to die. My mom had epilepsy, and she suffered an epileptic seizure for the first time when I was four years old, and she fell down, and, and I discovered her on the ground and having a, a seizure. It was extremely traumatic. And from that point on, I began to believe that I was going to always be alone because I thought my mom was going to die any day now. And I used to live with that as a constant fear. Tried to become as good as I could, but I didn't do a very good job of that by the time I was 15. I got tired of trying to be good, and I decided to be anything but good. And so, for my life, there was always a sense of loneliness, always a sense that, that I had nobody until I got saved. And the thing that mattered to me was what Jesus said, I will never leave you. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that he will never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. And so, when you're by yourself, when you think that nobody understands, and by the way, nobody ever really does, nobody ever really understands, there's only one who does, and that's Jesus Christ. And there's a psalm, we'll get to it one of these days, that speaks about him having our tears in his bottle. He knows what we go through, he knows our heart, he loves us, and that to me was, when I first got saved, and has remained over 33 years, a very key element of being a Christian. You see, because I chose not to be a religious man. I chose to have a relationship with a God who said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Though nobody knows your name, I call you by name. And though nobody understands what you feel sometimes, I understand your thoughts before they're even formed in your mind and the words before they come off your mouth. I know everything about you. And by the way, I love you anyway. And when the Lord taught me that and began to teach me that, I have to tell you, he is my guide. He's my guide through this life. That's what he's saying here. He is our guide even to death. He walks with you every step of the way and then welcomes you into his kingdom. Psalm 49. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together, my mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall bring understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will disclose my dark saying on the harp. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever." that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees that wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thoughts is that their houses will continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He's like the beasts that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and their posterity who approve their sayings, Selah. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. 
The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the, the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. Now, Psalm 48 was a psalm of the sons of Korah, and Psalm 49 is also a psalm of the sons of Korah. And this actually, as you just read with me, uh, this psalm speaks of the eternal question. And the eternal question that everybody seems to wonder at least one time in their life, some of us have wondered that more than once, is why, why do the wicked seem to constantly prosper? Why do evil people seem to get away with everything? And, uh, and we don't. I want you to see verse 4 says that this is a dark saying. When he says it's a dark saying, it's simply saying this is a riddle. This is something that is worth thinking about. And so he's speaking concerning the eternal question. That's what he speaks of. And it relates to everybody. Notice he's saying this to everybody. Verse 2, both low and high, rich and poor together. So he's speaking to everybody and he tells them that this is something that they need to hear. And he needs to uh, instruct them in. So the question, verse 5, Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. The redemption of their souls is costly. It shall cease forever uh, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. Though riches may provide earthly comforts and though riches provide security, in eternity, they are worthless. That's the point he's making. Now, obviously, I heard somebody say, I've been rich and I've been poor and rich is better. You know, and there are a lot of people who would agree with that heartily. They would say, absolutely. You know, I went through school. I got my degree. I continued to pursue uh, an education, got an advanced degree. I got a great job. The job required more of me, so I got another degree. And now I'm living very comfortably. I've got the nice house. I've got, got the nice car. I've got the nice things that, that I want. I'm living very comfortably. Well, somebody else may be saying, well, I'm a believer. I love the Lord. I've had a tough go at it. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that I have a job. And I'm thankful that I have a car. But the job I have feels sometimes like it's a dead-end job. It doesn't challenge me. It's absolutely boring. And my car, well... Well, I keep it together with, with, with wire and duct tape, and, and as I'm driving down the road, it shoots smoke signals, you know, and when I, when I try to start it, 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 it cries. I mean, I, I don't like my car very much at all, you know, and, 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 and the, the wicked person says, well, you know, they're the ones who sometimes, and I'm saying that every wicked person does this, of course, but you get a card sometimes from somebody, and they say, well, my kid just, you know, got accepted into an Ivy League school, you know, he was a class valedictorian. And your kid just got his GED and uh, just graduated out of uh, CYA. I mean, it's, it's something that you think, you know, I'm not quite sure about this, whether this is something I feel is fair. I think a lot of people do that. Wealth brings security, and who's to argue and say that it doesn't? There's a world of difference between somebody who has enough money to be able to take his child to the doctor any time that baby needs to go. There's a wealth of difference between that and the person who keeps praying every day, oh, God, don't let my child get sick because I don't I don't have insurance, and I don't have the ability to pay even if I have a sick child. God help me. And sometimes you see this, and sometimes it can cause your heart to, to, to truly ache. Well, he's saying, listen, riches can give you a sense of security, and there's no doubt about that. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with having money either. But as you'll see, when you put all your trust in your bank account, you've made a Poor choice in doing that because it can't usher you, usher you into etern eternity. I want you to notice in verse 6, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Why? While well, the redemption of their souls is costly. You can be very wealthy and trust in your wealth. Turn with me for a moment, please, to Mark's Gospel. 
Mark chapter 10. I want to remind you of a story found in the New Testament Gospel of Mark chapter 10, a, a passage of Scripture that we have seen many times. We've referred to it more than once, and, and as we're continuing our study on Sunday mornings in the Gospel of Mark, ultimately we'll get to this particular portion of Scripture, and I'll give you a detailed study on it. But here in Mark chapter 10 at verse 17, very famous story that illustrates this point. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were astonished beyond measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But looking at them, Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. How difficult it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it is impossible if you trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's difficult because you rely on your money and all that money brings to you. And money is power. I was speaking to a young person on a personal level not that long ago, and they were speaking about money, and I said to them, remember always that money is power. And uh, they didn't understand at that point, but we who are older understand it very well. Money is power. I was in D.C. a couple months ago. I go to get my room. We made arrangements for me to have a room when I arrived. I'm standing in line. I go up. And they say, sorry, Mr. Rosales, we don't have a room available. We're going to have to put you in another hotel. And I'm thinking, why is that? And it's because we have people who have decided to remain longer. And there's a law in D.C. That, that states that if you've got the room, you cannot be uh, evicted from it. And so we have to put you in another place. But I'll tell you this. If I were a wealthy man... And if I were standing there at that desk and they recognized me as not Rosales but Rockefeller, <laughs> they might have said, we have a place for you. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you they would have found me a room. If I'd have said, look at, do you have a room for the president? They'd have said, yes, we have a room for the president. Well, he's not showing up. Can I have his room? No. <laughs> if you have money, you have power. That's how it works. A friend of mine, I've told you this before, most of you have heard this, I'm sure, but a friend of mine, his name's Nick, Nick was dating a girl, she was going to school at Biola College, this is a long time ago now, about, about 30 years almost now, and uh, Nick said, Dave, I want to impress Debbie, uh, will you do me a favor? And I said, sure, he said, I borrowed a limousine, he says, I've got a jacket and I've got a hat, will you be my, my chauffeur? And I said, that would be fun, sure, so I had tennis shoes. I, you know, in jeans, and I had a jacket, a bellman's jacket with this, this gold epaulette, and I had this Greek fisherman hat. And I come pulling onto the campus at Biola, Nick's in the back seat of this limousine with his sunglasses on, and the students are staring into the car as we drive by, and I'm driving all cool, and, and, and Nick's kind of, you know. And we pull up, and we pick up Debbie, and he climbs. I actually got out, and I opened his door. By then, students are beginning to, who's this dignitary? And Nick climbs out, and he walks to the dorm and brings her back. I open the door, and she goes, hi, Dave, how are you? Doesn't even notice that she's climbing in a limousine, so that's how far she was impressed. And I drive them 
to a Los Angeles International Airport where he gets an early flight to go to San Francisco to take her to dinner, and he's going to take a later flight to come home. He was really, obviously, trying to impress this girl. But I'm sitting there in the red zone in a limousine, and I'm waiting for his dad to come out of the, uh, uh, in the terminal, and a police officer is walking towards me, and he's, he, and he's telling drivers to move. And I'm sitting there, when he walks up to the limousine, walks around me and tells the guy behind me to move. Money is power. Money's power. He didn't know that I didn't have two cents to my name. <laughs> he didn't know anything like that. And then Nick's dad comes out, opens the door and yells real loud, home James, laughs, climbs in and I drive him home in the back seat. <laughs> Money's power. And money gives advantages and we know that. If you have no money and you have, a, 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 you have a, a legal charge against you and you go before the judge or if you're very rich and you have a, a legal charge brought against you and you go before the judge, who's got the better chance of staying out of jail? Money has power. That's the way it is. Money gives advantages. But he says in eternity, can you bribe God? Can you say, Lord, you know, I got a few bucks here. I got some Benjamins, you know. I don't think so. The Lord doesn't care. He owns everything, including you. You can't bribe him. And so you have no security ultimately. This person here, this, this rich young ruler, he really thinks that he's doing well. I mean, I find it interesting. I have to be careful not to give the whole sermon to you that I'll be giving in a few weeks. But I find it interesting that when he speaks to Jesus and he says, I'm lacking something, even a, a person who is, who is a, uh, a religious person with tremendous advantages still senses a lack in their life. That's why he comes to Jesus Christ, an itinerant Jewish rabbi. And he says, I'm lacking something. Jesus says, you know the commandments. And I want you to note with me that here in Mark chapter 10, I want you to note with me that Jesus didn't even speak concerning the first portion of the law. The law is actually divided into two segments. You have, you have the laws that pertain to your relationship with God, and you have the laws that pertain to your relationship with man. The laws that pertain to God are the first four. The laws that pertain to man are the final six. And so Jesus doesn't even approach the laws that pertain to God. Why is that? It's because he's going to point the man out that you don't even keep the lower requirements, let alone the higher ones. Now, how do we know that? He says, go and take all that you have, sell it, give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But he couldn't do that. Why? Because wealth is power and advantage. The thought of pursuing an itinerant Jewish rabbi who knows where living in discomfort was much beyond him. He wanted his world and the world to come too. That's a way a lot of people are today. They want to go to heaven, but they want to live like hell. That's how they want to live. And they don't understand that you can't have both. You have a relationship with God or you don't. Jesus said, you can't worship God and mammon. You can't have both. You can't worship both equally. Now, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all that you have will be added unto you. You'll be taken care of. Now, remember, Jesus said, I pray like this, give us this day our daily bread. Most of us say, give us this month our monthly bread. We want more than is adequate. But Jesus said, I want to train you to live day by day trusting in me, relying on me, that's why James says God has made the poor to be rich in faith because they understand a day-by-day -day relationship with God. And a person who's got tremendous advantages of finances has a tendency of forgetting the God who blessed them in the first place. That's why God, when he was speaking to the children of Israel, said, don't forget, I am the one who gives you power to have wealth. He says, but the problem's going to be when you begin to say, by my own power and strength, I have gained these things. And he says, and you forget your God. And so, turning on back to the Psalms, to Psalm 49, he's saying, you have no real advantage. You can boast in the multitude of your riches, 
but you don't understand that, that, that redemption is too costly for you to pay. It's too costly for an ordinary human being to pay. Why is that? It's because, uh, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it's because you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's because God's, God's currency is not gold and it's not silver and it's not precious stones. It is blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. It is indeed extremely costly. Verse 10, For he sees that wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will continue forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He's like the beasts that perish. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that it's appointed unto men to die once and after this the judgment. There are those who actually believe in a second chance, who believe that they can die and then behold the glory of God and, and be drawn by God's awesome beauty and, and power to, uh, to actually come uh, to a saving relationship with God. They call it universalism. Everybody ultimately is going to be saved in that way of thinking. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches it's appointed unto men to die once and after that judgment, one time. So if I die as a re in a relationship with God in the grace of God, I enter into eternity in that grace. But if I die outside of Christ with no grace, no saving grace, I enter into eternity in that fashion, and I ultimately uh, am standing before God, and I will be judged because of that. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath. Righteousness delivers from death. See, the fact is, is riches can prolong your life, but death still is inevitable. Now, it's interesting, he goes on in verse 13 and says, This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their sayings. Selah. Selah means think about this. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave, Death shall feed on them, the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. But, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah, think about that. And so he says, and I want you to look at verse 14. This is interesting. He says, uh, like sheep, they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them. Uh, literally, it, it reads, death shall be their shepherd. And, and the point he's making is shepherds are supposed to feed the sheep, but here is a picture of death eating a sheep. And when you contrast that, when it says death shall feed on them, when you contrast that with Jesus who is our good shepherd, our good shepherd who lays his life down for us and he leads us beside the still water and he takes us to the green pastures. When you contrast death feeding on you or the good shepherd taking you to a place of feeding, the point he's making is quite obvious. The Lord is the one who protects us and cares for us through all that we go through. Now, there's a second thing I want you to see here, and it's interesting to me. In verse 14, the last portion, where it says, Their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. Their beauty shall be consumed in the grave. One of the... One of the television programs that was re recently on that I felt was really absolutely tragic, tragic, was The Swan. How many of you even know what program that was, The Swan, where these young ladies put themselves under the knife? I mean, they were willing to be cut up for their be to be beautiful. I saw a portion of one of the programs and a portion of another one just to see what's going on, and I was bored, to be honest with you, but it was tragic, absolutely tragic where you see these poor little things looking in the mirror saying, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful. And I thought, is that what we've done to you? Is that what this, what this society has done to you? We have made you think that unless you have a certain shape, unless your nose is a certain size, unless your hair is a certain way, unless your eyes look in a certain way, unless you dress in a certain way, that you have no value. I think one of the saddest things that we're seeing today is this incredible 
craze for elective cosmetic surgery. It's absolutely sad that people will take hundreds if not thousands of dollars so that they can build themselves up someplace or remove something from some other place. You know what I'm saying? And I got to go to the beach and I'm just so flat-chested, I got to go out there and put, and I think, how sad. Who are you? Well, you know, forgive me. Maybe I have some in this room who've done that and I'm not condemning you. I have to be careful because I know that some have done so and I don't want to come off condemning you and I have to be careful. Forgive me if I've hurt you. But I think about that and I think, what did we do to make a person feel that unless you have a certain color eyes, you know, there is a new cosmetic surgery. All of you have heard of this. It's, uh, they're using laser to actually remove color from your eyes. So if you have brown eyes, but you've always wanted to have blue eyes, they can actually use laser now to remove the color brown until they can produce a, a, the shade of eyes that you want. And there are tons of people who are, are standing in line because I've always wanted to have a different color eye. And I say, well, you know what? On the one hand, I can understand how you can not appreciate the way you look. I understand that. I was 16 years old, and I was going to a school that was predominantly surfer. And me, I had been what you call a continental for two years. Does anybody know what a continental is? I know I've got somebody who's got to know that. You know what a continental is? I'll tell you what a continental is, okay. I used to wear the racer slacks. I used to have my hair in a pompadour. You know, I was a continental. You know, what can I say, you know? And uh, a lot of us were, were that way, wore the jackets, the whole nine yards. But I was at a surfer school. And after a while, I started thinking, you know, there are, I'm probably one of the only continentals around. Maybe I ought to do... And I started going to the beach. And I started getting tans. And I started thinking, you know, I'd like to have blonde hair. So I got two bottles of peroxide. <laughs> and I dyed my hair. I tried to bleach it blonde. It turned out orange. <laughs> I had orange hair and the brown uh, eyebrows and orange, orange hair. But I thought I looked so absolutely cool because I wanted to look different. So see, I, forgive me if it sounds like I don't understand that to a degree I do. I wanted to change my appearance. And then when I went to school and I've got my roots are showing and, and all, I thought, well, I had to dye it back to my original color. So I tried to dye it brown and it turned out green. And I had green hair, so, you know, some of the punkers, I was way ahead of those punkers with the blue and the green hair. I mean, you know, I had green hair a long time before they did, but I wasn't proud of it. I understand that, but at the same time, their beauty shall be consumed in the grave. All of the augmentation, all of the work that is done to make their bodies look as firm and fit as is possible, all of the workouts, all of the diets, all of the tanning, all of the trimming down is all ultimately is worthless. So just, just, just eat, get fat, die, you know, <laughs> and die happy. I mean, when they look at you inside that coffin, they'll say, I know what killed this person. <laughs> no, someone is taking me, literally, I'm just kidding, of course. The Bible tells us in Job 21.13 that they spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Job 21.26 says they lie down alike in the dust and worms cover them. Their beauty shall be consumed. Please, please. I mean, it's not as if I'm saying don't take care of yourself. Of course. And the Bible teaches that we should care for ourselves. Bodily exercise does profit a little. And I think that we ought to take care of what God has given to us. On the other hand... If we get caught up with the outer appearance and don't cultivate the person of the heart, we've really missed things. And let me tell you something. Uh, I think that my wife, Marie, is a very beautiful woman and all, and I, I, I really do. But what attracted me to, to Marie was not, was not her outer beauty. What attracted me to that girl was her heart. There was something about her that I hadn't seen in another woman before. There was something about her heart. And I fell in love with her before I even noticed that that, that she was pretty too because it's the heart and if you cultivate the heart that's the key it really is take care of your body too but take care of your heart first now in verse 15 when he says but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave he shall receive me I find it interesting how he says but God will redeem my soul God alone is able to redeem the price of redemption is costly 
It's so expensive, only He can pay it. That's why the Bible says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And the cost of redemption is great. Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says it this way, We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, He says, you have been saved. In verse 16, do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. You've never seen a, a hearse with a U-Haul, in other words. His glory shall not descend after him, though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. You know, a man with money has always got friends. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. And so on the one hand, the individual who doesn't know the Lord perishes and is soon forgotten. But on the other hand, the poor, when they have a relationship with the Lord, look forward to being with Him and ultimately spending eternity with Him. And I'll close with, with a thought. Though the, um, the rich may seem like they're going to get away with everything, including murder, and never get judged, God is the ultimate judge. And God sees, and God deals with that. And the Bible tells us very, very clearly that naked we came from our mother's womb, and naked we shall return. You can take nothing with you. But what happens, guys, you may not take anything with you, but what you have has been sent before you. That's why Jesus says that we should have treasures in heaven because all you really ever have is that which you have already sent ahead. You don't take it with you. You send it before you. You came into this world naked and you leave in the same way. So the rich man, the poor man have one thing in common. Both die and both stand before the Lord. Now God has done a work of redemption we, by faith, receive that. We say, God, I know that the cost of salvation is costly, and I realize that even if I were Bill Gates with the billions of dollars that he has, that it's nothing to you. And so, Lord, I can't buy my salvation. I can only receive it. I cannot purchase it through works or attempt to do so in any fashion because I can't receive it that way. I have to humble myself and say, be, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I deserve your, your justice and I deserve judgment, but I'm asking for mercy. And God, because He is rich in mercy through His Son, Jesus Christ, forgives us of all of our sins. So none of us can boast before God saying, we entered in based on our righteousness because none of us is righteous. We can only enter in with a humble and thankful heart by saying, God, you were merciful to me. I didn't deserve it, but I did receive it, and I thank you. So we all stand before the Lord, even the atheist who says God is a figment of their imagination stands before the God of the whole earth who will judge him. We say, God, be merciful to us now. In faith I receive you. Forgive me. As a result of that, we have life. But if we reject him, then we stand in our own righteousness. And when you stand before God in your own righteousness, you haven't got a chance. If you try to be your own defense attorney in a capital case and you know nothing of the law, you are dead while you're standing there, especially when you know you're guilty. But when you stand and you say, I'm throwing myself on the mercy of the court, and you have a defense attorney who says, I've already taken care of the payment, it's all been taken care of, this person is not guilty because his penalty's been paid. Well, that's what happens when you and I stand before the Lord. I say, Jesus, be merciful unto me, a sinner. He washes me. I am now declared innocent, and I can stand before God as somebody who, who can enter in based on what he's done, not what I do. We need to remember that, 
every day. Meditate on that every day. It produces humility and a heart of service because we're grateful for what God has done.